Okay, let's get going. A lot to discuss this evening. And the topic, of course, is still Abraham and his wife, Sarah. There's a lot going on. And last week's Torah portion was Lech Lecha. And we saw God appear to Abraham to give him the first of his 10 tests to leave his home, to leave Haran, the comfort, the success, the financial, the spiritual success that he built up and to leave it all behind and go to a land that he wasn't even sure would be so successful. This was a great challenge and test for Abraham. The tests continue and this week's Torah portion of Ayera is going to conclude with the final and 10th test of Abraham. And that is going to be our journey. However, before we get there, we see there's a transition. You see, the end of last week's Torah portion, Parsha, ends with the circumcision of Abraham. You see, before that point, God visited Abraham, but it was always a little bit shrouded in mystery, wasn't so clear what exactly God was saying, what he expected of Abraham. Suddenly we move into a whole new realm, which is post the Brit Milah. This physical sign that Abraham and God were now going to have an open and clear dialogue with each other because the Brit Milah is a promise. It's a covenant that cannot be broken. So now Abraham moves from one Torah portion and it now reflects in this Torah portion with the circumcision being the bridge that connects them both together. There is also a connection that you can only really get into the land of Israel once you have this Brit Milah. There is a strong connection with the Jewish people needed to actually circumcise themselves en masse many years later before they could enter into Israel at the times of Joshua. And that's where the Torah portion opens, my friends, with the healing of Abraham. And he sits, the Yerah Allah Hashem, Hashem reveals himself. He appears to Abraham. That's the clear revelation that only a circumcised Abraham could receive and feel. He's now pushed himself into a whole different realm of physical existence through this one act of the circumcision. And he's sitting by Elone Mamre in the plains of Mamre. Who is Mamre? The Torah speaks of. We're in chapter 18, verse 1 of the book of Bereshit of Genesis. Who is Mamre? So Mamre was a guy, a very special man, who was a follower of Abraham and very much wanted Abraham to use his land to do this mitzvah of circumcision. And we know from last week that Abraham was extremely wealthy and successful and yet refused to live in a house. He wanted to live in a tent, not because he was in tents, but because he wanted to move around. Because you can only impact people if you go to where they are. Take your case to them. And we said the Jewish people, ever since that time, have been a traveling people. Don't believe what the textbooks tell you. The Jews are nomads. We're not. We have a homeland, Israel. But until we get full-time permanent residence there at the times of the Messiah, we're going to have to move around and pick up the sparks of holy converting souls throughout the world. And that's what Abraham was doing. Abraham is sitting at the entrance to his tent after having circumcised himself. It is the third day after the circumcision, which is the most painful because the recovery was very, very difficult. And God himself had come to visit Abraham in order to be what we call Mavaker Cholim, visit the sick. That is what God himself had done. Where is Abraham? Who Yoshe Petacha Ohel at the entrance to his tent. Kachomayom. And it was a really hot day. Why was it hot? And why is it mentioned? The Torah doesn't usually mention the weather. Obviously, it's an integral part of the story. And it is here. God made it hot because he didn't want any travelers to come by and to bother Abraham. He knew that Abraham was obsessed with welcoming guests into his home and with feeding them and taking care of them and then bringing them under the Kanfei Shechin, under God's heavenly protective wings and making them ethical and moral 
monotheists, something that Abraham, the Jewish people, have done pretty, pretty well over a few thousand years of Jewish history. However, Abraham was more in pain of not having guests than he was from recovering from the circumcision. And therefore, he put himself at the entrance, at the petach hell, not inside the tent, which would have been cool and better, but at the entrance looking for guests. So God had to be like, all right, I hear you want guests. It's a very hot day. No one's walking around. I'm going to bring you guests. What did God do? God brought three angels. The Yisenav, Abraham lift up his eyes. The Yar and he saw Shalosh Hashem, three men, Nitzav and Malav, just standing there. They just appeared, which only angels can do. They popped out of nowhere in the form of man. There is actually a machloket, a very interesting disagreement among the rabbis. Did Abraham know they were angels or not? Some say that he didn't know they were angels. Most say he didn't know they were angels. He thought there were actually three individuals who were passing by, who were hot and thirsty and hungry and tired and needed the shelter of Abraham's home. However, there are others that say that Abraham had angels in his house all the time. He knew an angel when he saw one, and yet he realized God was doing it as a favor, so he kind of like bought into it. But we're going to go with the Mahalach, with the way of saying that Abraham actually was not aware that they were angels. And they were standing there, and what did he do? Oh, by the way, what is the double expression in verse 2? Vayiser enav vayar. He lifted his eyes and he saw. What do you mean he lifted his eyes and he saw the Yisam used to lift up the Yar and he saw? Why the double expression? Just say, he saw three guys standing over there. He wanted guests. So he ran out and went to get them. What's his whole? Lift up his eyes and he saw. So I had two interpretations. One of them is probably Peshat, which is he lifted up his eyes, which means he actually saw them. And the Yar, the second expression of seeing is that he saw he had to do something. It's like we say, you know, in English it works as well. I see I should do something. You don't see, you think you should do something. No, I see. The visual is just a formula that makes me realize I need to jump into action, which is precisely what he does. One of my great rabbis, he was actually a bit of a Kabbalist, said a beautiful understanding over here. Why the double expression of seeing and seeing twice? Because when Abraham lifted up his eyes, even a small act like that has major spiritual relevance when Abraham does it. You hear? In other words, he lifted up his eyes. That's worth noting. The Yar and he saw there were three people were passing by, so he jumped into action. But when Abraham lifts up his eyes and the Torah tells you, something big is about to happen. Even mundane actions like that take on incredible spiritual relevance. How cool is that idea? That was from a rub man saw many years ago. Okay, so he sees them. And what does he do? The Yaratz Likratam, he runs out to greet them. Me petal from the entrance to his tent. And what does he do? He bows down to them. Now, Abraham was famous, successful, rich, and yet he had extreme humility. He never saw himself above the other people. If these were people in need, I'm going to go and get them. And he didn't just say, oh, I'm Abraham. Let them come to me. Do you know who I am? I'm the great Abraham. Come hang out in my tent. He's not doing that. He went out and he jumps. And he bows down. He calls them my masters. Believe me, they weren't his masters. They were just wayfarers that were passing by. And yet he gives them extreme comfort, extreme honor. This is one of the key traits of Abraham. Giving honor to others. We know the Mishnah tells us that the person who wants to be honored is the one who should give honor. If people run to give honor to others, they will be honored. People chase honor themselves, honor is going to flee from them. Honor has this reverse effect, and we learn this out from a number of places, including Abraham. And now he talks them into coming into his house. He says, please come in. If I've done, if chen be'anecha, if I've got any chen, grace in your eyes, don't pass by from your master. He calls himself a master. Mialabecha. The great Abraham has called himself an Eved. Yukach, take na ma'at ma'im. A little bit of water. Rachsur aglechem. Wash your feet. V'shtok out the eight. And come under the tree. I'll give you a little bit of bread. He says, come by 
I'm gonna take care of you. You can have a little bit of bread, a little bit of water. What does he end up giving them, by the way? He ends up giving them the most lavish feast, a seven course meal. So what is he, if he's trying to bring them in and talk them into coming to his tent, why doesn't he be like, I got seven course meal, I got shawarma, I got falafel, I got hummus, tahina, kharif if you want. Do you want salad? We have salad. Whatever you want, we have for you. Why does he do that? Why is he saying bread, water, and then giving this big meal? We learn also from the Mishnah Pira Kavot, a very important lesson, not just about Abraham, but about everyone. When it comes to dealing with others, you promise little, you offer small, but you do big. Say little, but do lots. Say little, but do lots. That is Abraham. Abraham is Mr. I got a little bit of bread, a little bit of water. As soon as they turn up, lavish feast. That is like so Abraham. There is a contrast that is made between Abraham and someone we're going to meet a little bit later, right after the death of Abraham's wife, Sarah. And that is a guy called Ephron, Hachiti, Ephron the Hittite. Ephron the Hittite is compared to Abraham as being opposite in terms of his character. Abraham promises little and delivers big. Ephron promises big and says, Abraham, I've got a place for you to bury your wife. Oh my goodness, money, please. It's almost free. He ends up charging him the equivalent of millions of dollars. Okay, that's the opposite. Those are two traits. We have to be students, says the Mishnah, of Abraham. Follow Abraham. Be hospitable. Say little, but do lots. Don't overpromise, especially not your children. Children are going to play a major role in this week's Pasha. Not only Yitzchak, but also his other child. Watch carefully. This is unbelievable. Okay, so they come into the house and they're going to join him. And then in verse 6, things speed up even more. If you remember before, he was ruts. He was running to go get these guests. And now he goes planet mental. He runs back into the tent, El Sara, and says, Vayome Mahari, quickly, Tasi, Ugot, right? Make Ugot. Ugot, what's that? What's he making? Um, why is he rushing in? They ain't going anywhere. Where are they going to go? The only town they got after where Abraham is, on the plains of Mamre, is Sodom and Amorah. One of the five towns that was famous for hating guests, for torturing guests, for killing people who actually welcomed guests into their home. It was the North Korea of its day. We don't want you here. And if you come in and don't follow the rules, you're dead. So why is he rushing? What's he doing over here? And it doesn't stop. He's not telling just Sarah to rush. He then says in verse 7, Vial habakar ratzavram. And now he runs to get this beautiful, delicious cattle, right? And he gets a good one and he gets the best part of the animal, which is the tongue. Personally, I can't eat the tongue. I don't know what it is. I know they say it's the best part of the animal. I have a funny relationship with tongue. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what it is. I see it there with the bits on top of it, but they say it's the best part. I don't know what it is. I'm just a, I'm a one-way licker. I can only, you know, I can't lick something that can lick me back. It's delicious. Bakar. Rach v'tov, and he cooks it, and he starts off with butter, and he, after milk, he gives him the meat because he's following the laws. Why is he rushing? Why is Abraham rushing here and rushing there? And why is he making Sarah rush? And what is this Ugot business? What is going on over here? Watch this unbelievable piece of information, my friends. If you hear this, it can change everything you know about Judaism, Abraham, and Jewish holidays. You know what Rashi tells us? You know why he was rushing? It was Pesach. I'm sorry? It was Pesach time. How do you know, Rashi? It was Pesach. Because it says to his wife, Asi Ugot. Ugot, modern Hebrew is cakes or cookies. But the word of God is going to appear hundreds of years later when the Jewish people leave with ugot matzot on their backs. Ugot, that's the last word in verse 
six is actually matzah. Why was Abraham giving matzah to these guests? It was Pesach. Pesach? What are you talking about? How can it be Pesach? Pesach is a holiday that we celebrate to commemorate the exodus from Egypt, right? We weren't even in Egypt yet. It was Abraham's descendants hundreds of years later that would end up in Egypt, at least four, five hundred years later. So what do you mean it was Pesach? From here, we're going to learn a very important idea, first about time and then about Abraham and then about welcoming guests. And it goes like this. We don't celebrate Pesach just because the Jewish people left Egypt. Pesach is a time of year that has always existed. What is it? It's the time of freedom. Zman cheruteinu. That's what it's called in the Torah. Zman, the time of our freedom. It always was. Abraham was able to tap into that time even before the Jewish people were in Egypt because God created time at creation. And therefore, part of the fabric of time was a date called the 15th of Nisan. That date always was a time of freedom. It's part of the fabric of time. It happens to be that in the Jewish year 2448, the Jewish people in that year were able to tap into that time energy and use it to get out of Egypt. But we don't, listen very carefully, we don't celebrate Pesach because the Jewish people left Egypt. It's the other way around. The Jewish people left Egypt because it was Pesach. I'll say that again. We don't just celebrate Egypt as a commemoration of the Jewish people leaving Egypt. I mean, we do, we discuss it. But it's actually the complete reverse. The reason the Jewish people left Egypt is because the 15th of Nisan is freedom time. And they were able to access that fabric of time, which always was a time of freedom. It always was even to the time of Abraham. Abraham realized that this is the time of freedom. And what food do you eat at the time of freedom? Matzah. Matzah is freedom food, always was. We just realized that when we left Egypt. That was the clearest example. But every single year from the beginning of creation up until now, 15th of Nisan is freedom time. Abraham knew it. The Jewish people and Moses were able to tap into that time when they left Egypt. And that gate of freedom, that shar, is open to us every single year at Pesach. Because time operates like a spiral. You end up at the same time every single year. As you say in Hebrew, Bayam Mehem. It happened back then, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three and a half thousand years ago. But Zman has said, this is the time. So every year we're able to tap into the time and go free ourselves. So if it's true for Abraham, it's true for us. Why matzah? Why is matzah equal freedom? And why is he giving it to the guests? So here we see something unique about matzah. Matzah is uniquely Jewish food. I know what you're thinking. Aren't bagels the Jewish fruit? And you are right, bagels are the Jewish fruit. As I always say, that's why we're the holy people, right? We're the holy nation, so we eat bagels. I'll be here all night. Thank you so much. Enjoy the chicken. But matzah is the real Jewish food. It really is. Why? How is matzah made? Why is matzah different from bagels or bread? Because matzah is made quickly. As soon as the water touches the flour, you've got 18 minutes to knead it, mush it around, and stick it in the oven. That's the, the difference is time. What was Abraham rushing for? Because these people are hungry and they want to eat. So what does he say? He says, quickly, we have a mitzvah to do. As the rabbis tell us, mitzvah baliado. If the chance for a mitzvah comes to your hand, Al tachmitzena, don't let your mitzvot become chametz. How can mitzvot become chametz? Chametz is leavened bread because you leave it. You let it rise and don't get involved in it. Abraham was running around. Why? He was helping the guests and teaching us a lesson. That's why God included this story in the Torah of him rushing to teach you that when you have the chance to do a mitzvah, 
Don't let your mitzvot become chametz. That's where the same word for mitzvot is matzot. Matzot and mitzvot are the same letters, different vowels. Don't let your mitzvot become stale chametz. If the chance for a mitzvah appears, get the job done. That is Abraham. Abraham represents chesed, kindness. But kindness is only good when you get it done now. You're dying of thirst. I'll be calm. I'll give you water. I'll be back in two days. That's not kindness. Chesed needs another trait, which is called zrizut. Zrizut, when I was a kid, right, my children learned it as run, run, run. It may involve rushing around, which Abraham was doing, but it means acting with alacrity or passion. Okay? And that's why he's eating ugot matzot. Yes, chapter does mention it's bread. We also call lechem, we also call matzah lechem. It is lechemoni. Just because it's called lechem, that doesn't mean it's actual bread. The fact that it's called lechem means that it was the bread of its day, which is why matzah is also called lechem. It's not a contradiction. Yeah, matzah lechem is matzah. It is the bread that we eat at Pesach, but it's not leavened. The bread which Abraham gave the guests was not leavened. It was flat. It was made quickly. Why? The guests are hungry. Matzah represents freedom and that is involved in chesed. So he moved quickly to get the job done. He acted with great speed. Now there's another character mentioned in this story and he's mentioned as the Na'ar. If you look in verse 7, so he runs to get this Bakar. By the way, Bakar... Bakar is cattle. If you rearrange the letters, you get kever, says the Benish Chai, right? A great Kabbalist from Iraq in the late 1800s. He says, in the merit of doing this mitzvah, of rushing to help these guests to come into his home and giving them the best food that he had and taking care of them and treating them so beautifully, which he did to every single guest, he was able from the Bakar to get kever, what's kever? The burial place. He actually found the future burial place of his wife, Sarah, that was owned by Ephron and ended up buying it to bury himself. By the way, who was buried there at that point? Adam and Eve. And eventually Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah. That's Marat HaMachpelah in Hebron, which is still a holy site of the Jewish people in the land of Israel that Abraham is gonna end up buying for a vast amount of money. That will be a future class, uh, God willing. But it mentions this, he gives it to the Na'ar. What's a Na'ar? Nun, Ayin, Reish. A Na'ar is a young lad. Who's the young lad in this story? It can't be Isaac, because Isaac wasn't born yet. So who is this young lad? Ishmael. Yishmael. His child through his wife, concubine, Hagar. Why does it mention Ishmael by name? Why does it call him the boy? Says Rabbi Hassan Rafael Hirsch, had he just called him Ishmael, you would have thought, ah, that's Ishmael, his descendants. They get involved in chesed. They're the ones who help out their parents. He says instead it's made anonymous so that every child who reads this says, I want to be the boy that helps, or the girl, that helps my parents do chesed. Abraham was able to continue his chesed through his children, Yishmael and Yitzchak. What did he do? He involved them in chesed. He didn't just say, hear me, look at me. He's like, go and get involved. And we do the same thing. We make our children prepare for Shabbat. Go get your clothes ready. Get your homework. Go put the... Uh, the challah on the table. Go live. I don't want to. I'm tired. Get the job done. It doesn't stop with you. We learn from this story. You need to engage your children in chesed as early and as young as possible. We don't want to create spoiled little brats who just take. We want them to be givers. And so the guests come in and I guess he realizes very quickly that they are actually angels because each one of these three angels has a different mission and information that they want to give Abraham. One of the big missions, of course, was to tell Abraham that Sodom and Omorah, these towns were gonna to be wiped out. But the 
first mission was to tell Sarah, tell Sarah that she was going to have a child. That she was going to have a child. That then follows this very weird conversation between Abraham, Sarah, and God. Because when Abraham is told he's going to have a child, what does he do? He laughs. Right afterwards, when Sarah overhears that she is going to have a child, she laughs as well. And God gets upset with her for laughing. Later on, she's going to have a child. She's going to give him the weirdest name that I think exists in the Jewish history, which is laughter. Yitzchak, Isaac means laughter. And then she laughs again after he's born. And God says, that's great. What is going on? What is this whole story of Isaac, laughter, she laughs, it's terrible, he laughs. What is laugh? What does laughter represent? And I have a whole talk just on laughter, which you can find on YouTube if you want. But I'll just summarize it for the purpose of this story. Laughter is a sign that you're shocked. When do you laugh? Pfft, I never saw that coming, right? If you know the punchline is coming, you're not going to laugh. When you hear a joke, you hear the punchline. Pfft, oh, that's a good one. If I tell you the same joke again, you're like, I'm not going to laugh. Why not? I heard that one already. You know, like my father should live and be well. Tells me the same joke 15 times. Right? I'm like, that. I know this one. And he still laughs at the end of the joke. You know what I'm saying? So laughter is a sign that, pfft, wow, I never saw that coming. When Abraham laughed, it was a laughter that came from simcha, from happiness. When Sarah laughed, says Rashi, it was a sign of dis. Really? Me? At 90 years old? I'm going to have a chat. You, Sarah, don't believe that? You, whose level of prophecy is greater than that of Abraham, you don't believe it? How do I know you don't believe it? Because you laugh. And you laugh like, I can't believe it. You could do better than that. Later on, when she has the child, she laughs again. She laughs again. This time, says Rashi, it's a laughter of simcha. A laughter that is combined with happiness. I laugh from the joy, not the disbelief. Someone of the caliber of Sarah with her level of prophecy should have believed that even her at the age of 90 having a child was not an impossibility. She should realize that that's a guarantee from an angel of God. It's going to happen. That's how Abraham accepted it. And that's how she should have accepted it. Why was he given the name laughter? Now, this is a whole talk in of itself. But the way the name Yitzhak doesn't mean laughter. It means there will be laughter. It's in the future tense. Say the rabbi something unbelievable. They say that when Sarah named her son Isaac Yitzhak, there will be laughter. She was actually receiving a nevoah from God, a prophecy. And the prophecy was that in the future, as Yamales Chopinu, there'll be a time when your descendants will have a complete salvation, a complete redemption in the days of the Messiah, Mashiach, and then our mouths will be full of real laughter. Isaac's life was not funny. It was difficult. It was challenging. He's going to end up at the end of the Parsha able and willing to give up his life on Mount Moriah and be sacrificed by his own father. It's the unfunniest life in history. And yet, there will be laughter. Right now, in Galut, we are suffering, and Galut begins with Isaac. The 410 years of Galut, of exile, started with the birth of Isaac. However, we're being told, you've got to realize there's an end. There's a punchline to Jewish history. In the end, there'll be a Messiah. Az, Az means then. Yamales Pinu says King David, our mouths will be full of laughter. That is the secret. There's a lot more to this, but that is the short secret of the name of Isaac, that life and exile are challenging and difficult, but in the end, we will have the last laugh when the Messiah comes to redeem us. I have another 15 minutes before I open up to questions. I see many people have questions online. I want to finish off 
with the last and final test of Abraham. And this is the most difficult. We mentioned that when tests come and a person is tested a number of times, the tests are invariably more difficult as the tests continue, as they progress. So test number one is tough. You pass it, it becomes more difficult, right? It has to be that way. You don't have a five-year-old sitting graduate level tests and you don't have a graduate student sitting uh, fifth grade level tests. It's obviously going more difficult. It's true academically, but it's true spiritually and psychologically and emotionally. And so Abraham has 10 tests, as we mentioned last week, which started with Lech Lecha and ends over here with the binding of Isaac. What is this? God tells Abraham to take the son that he promised him to his wife, Sarah, and says, you're going to have to bring him to Mount Moriah, the future home of the temple in Jerusalem, and bring him as a sacrifice. Now, Abraham loved his son, Isaac, didn't want to sacrifice him. But the test was so much more difficult than just lose, potentially losing his son, as I'm about to show you. What did Abraham do his entire life? What was the main job of Abraham? To go away from idol worship. Everyone is worshiping idols. And what was the main way they worshiped idols? By killing their children, sacrificing their own sons and daughters for God. I know it sounds abhorrent, but don't think it's so weird. To this day, in the Jewish year 5781, 2020, people are still willing to kill themselves for God. We saw it yesterday, going around knowing full well they're going to get shot, but this is what God wants. That's what Abraham spent his entire life saying. Don't kill your children for God. Don't kill yourselves for God. Live for God. Now that's tough. Blowing yourself up, shooting innocent people and getting shot yourself. That's not what God wants. God wants you to live for him, not to die for him. Now this test has a whole new context. Abraham, who spent his entire life, a hundred years saying, don't kill your children, has now been told, listen carefully, to kill his own son. Now imagine that. Imagine Abraham walking with his son Isaac to this mountain. And everyone knows Abraham. And he wasn't told to bring him as a sacrifice in a cellar. He didn't tell him, put him down in his cell and shoot him in the head. Take him to a mountain. Mountains in the Torah are always places of instruction where information is going to be spread. That's why the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. That's why the temple was built on Mount Moriah. So here we are on the future temple mount. That means everyone's going to know about this. And he's walking along and people say, Abraham, where are you going? And he's like, I'm going to that mountain. They're like, well, what are you going to do in it? And why is Isaac with you? I'm going to bring a sacrifice. Really? A ram? A cow? Some wheat? A bird? No. Boop. My son, Isaac. And like, I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What did you just say? Haven't you been telling us for decades not to kill our children? Do you know what Abraham would have to say to them, whether he liked it or not? He had no choice. He's going to have to say, I was wrong. I was wrong. Do you know how humiliating that is? To go against everything you believe, everything that you've been told your entire life and realize you made a mistake, the level of humility, of self-sacrifice. Forget the fact he has to kill his son. I mean, that's difficult of itself. But the psychological challenge that comes with realize your entire life has been incorrect. It wasn't incorrect. He was right. But at this point, he thought that he was wrong. How do we know that he was right? Because he goes up into the mountain and he brings out a knife and God says, stop, don't do it. 
this is not what I want, but you showed me you're willing to sacrifice the most special thing you have, your own child. You hear? For Abraham, it's a test. For everybody else in world history, it's a lesson. What kind of lesson? A living, diagrammatic, physical lesson. This we don't do. Abraham could walk around saying, don't kill your kids. And he had been saying it. Now he's going to have to stand on a mountain and show the entire world. You see, this is what God doesn't want you to do. So for Abraham, it was a test and a great test, which he passed with flying colors. But for the rest of us, it's a lesson of what not to do. There's a little piece of the story which everyone jumps over, but I must share it with you. And I think it's very, very pertinent, even more than the sacrifice part. When Abraham wakes up that morning, it says that he woke up early. But listen to this amazing idea. This can change your life. It says, Vayashkem Abraham Baboker. Abraham woke up early in the morning. When I was a child and all the commentators say the same thing. He was so ready to take on this extremely difficult challenge of bringing his own son, the son he loved from his wife, Sarah, who had miraculously become pregnant. He was so ready to do it. He was even willing to wake up early in order to do the right thing. That's how I learned it. And that's true. You know what I heard from Rabbi Abraham Tversky, one of my gurus, something unbelievable. Why does the Torah tell us, Vayashkem Avram Baboker, Avram woke up early in the morning. You know what you learn from that? That Abraham was asleep. You can only wake up if you're asleep. Think about that. Think about it very, very well. Abraham knew that the next morning he's going to bring his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Who in their right mind goes to sleep? Who has the ability, the serenity, the tranquility to go get a full night's sleep? You'd be up all night. Please, God, don't do it. Reconsider. This is my one son who I love through Sarah, my wife. She's going to be so upset. This is the future of the Jewish people. It makes no sense. It's illogical. You know, Abraham had the most amazing faith in God. Do you know how we know that? That he was able to go to sleep the night before this incredible challenge. Think about it today. People don't even sleep anymore. We're so stressed out, so much going on. We're up to late. Abraham had serenity, had the perfect emunah peshuta. This is what God wants. Difficult, challenging. I don't want to do it. I realize this is what I need to do. I'm going to bed. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having the peace of mind, the serenity and tranquility and faith in God that even at the most difficult challenge, you're able to say, good night, I'm going to bed. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That is, my friend, the power of Abraham. That even at the most daunting challenge of his life, the greatest test, after which God doesn't even fully communicate with him because he had finished his mission in this world. He got to live on, right? Filled the rest of the years, 175, no problem. But God only comes and communicates when you have a job to do and he gets the job done and he passes this test and Abraham becomes Shalem. This son, Yishmael, ends up leaving but coming back and doing Teshuvah, repentance, and being involved in the mitzvah of burying Abraham, his father. So too, the Yishma'alite nations are going to come back at the end of days when Mashiach comes, and will be there to do teshuva at the end of days as well. That, my friends, completes the test journey of Abraham. I see some questions. Why did he need so many tests to prove himself to Hashem? He didn't need to prove himself to Hashem. God gave him the test so he could prove 
himself to himself. God tests us so that we can become great. God doesn't want to see us suffering. He does it. God tests us so that we can reach higher levels. The teacher gives the student a test. What? To prove to the teacher you know the information? No! So that you can prove to yourself that you can do it. You're going to use the information to get to the next level and the next level and the next level. That is the understanding of what a Nisoyan is. Yes, Abraham laughed. He laughed from joy of knowledge that and simcha that he was going to have a child. There are lots of rabbis in history who would kill, sacrifice themselves to spread Torah. Rabbi Ari Kaplan has a whole book on this one thing and says this desire and ability and willing to sacrifice children is the reason that people are able, the Jewish people, his descendants in the future, to give themselves up physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually in order to do mitzvot in the future. This is actually the makor, the source that people are able to do it. Had Abraham Noel's fit into Nisan and Pesach? That I don't know. That's above my pay grade. Abraham was a prophet of God and he understood this information. He understood this information.